All right, so today we're gonna move into chapter three of Colossians. I know it feels, it's kind of, it feels like we spent forever trying to get here, but here's the good news. We're almost at the end. We're gonna do chapter three this week, and then we're gonna finish up Colossians next week. So how about that? So we're gonna, we're gonna be done, and this summer we'll move into working through some of the Psalms. Um, but I'm excited. This is a good chapter. It's a lot today, but it's gonna be a wonderful time. So, so up to this point, Paul has argued that Christ is enough. Right? That's the argument of Paul. Christ is enough. That goes for our salvation, but it also counts for our sanctification. Not only does he save us, but he perfects us. Remember? Um, and so as Jonathan Edwards so well summarized, we mentioned this last week, he says that you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. And last week, we looked at shadows of Christ, right? The feasts, the rituals, the rites, the circumcision of the flesh. And we read that Paul said there's no salvific power in these. These can't save. They can't even keep you in the good graces of God. Instead, he said we're dead to those things. Those are shadows of Christ. We're dead to those, and we're alive in Christ. So that's where we're at today, and we're going to pick up this morning. Let's pray before we read our text. Father, we pray that we would be brought daily to the cross. We ask that we would not seek to find our salvation in the shadows of Christ, but in the substance of Christ. Be with us now as we study further this letter. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, Colossians 3, 1 through 17. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no, not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Church, the grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of God stands forever, and this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. So on the heels of telling the Colossian church that they are dead to the old rituals, they're dead to the old rites, and they're alive in Christ, Paul begins to dive a little deeper into what that means and what that looks like. And so today we're going to break our text into four parts. So the first part is a thesis. So in verses 1 through 4, we kind of see Paul's thesis, his statement. He says, seek the things above. Right? Seek the things above. Then the second point, we have a negative command, things to put off in 5 through 11. Then we have a positive command in 12 through 14, 14, things to put on. And then we have a conclusion in 15 to 17. So thesis in 1 through 4, negative command in 5 through 11, positive command in 12 through 14, and a conclusion in 15 through 17. So let's go first to the thesis. Let's read that again, verses 3, 1 through 4. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
So Paul says, if it's true then, if it's true that you've been raised with Christ, seek the things of Christ. And the word for seek is, is what we would call, uh, we get some, some grammar here, a present imperative, okay? So it's, a, so it's a present command. It's a in the now kind of command. And here is one that kind of conveys a continual action. So, so I explain this. If I tell my children to sit down for dinner, it means they are to sit down for the entirety of the dinner, right? Sit down for dinner doesn't mean sit and then pop up. It means stay, continue through your sitting for the whole dinner. And that's what Paul does with the present paragraph. He says, seek the things that are above. Don't just seek them for the moment. Seek them continually for the duration of this life. And this plays against the Gnostics. Remember, what do they want? They want the church at Colossae to seek things below, right? They want the church to seek rituals, to seek after rites, to seek after philosophies. And Paul says, no, no, no. Seek the things above, imperative. Seek consistently in the now. Continue to seek. This is a command. Why? Because that's where Christ is. Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's not in the shadows. He's not in the forms. He's ruling in the light of the glory of the Father at the right hand of the Father. Fully human, fully God. And so this act of seeking goes hand in hand with your mindset. So look at, so he seeks the things of heaven, seek the things of Christ. Then look at verse two. He says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Hear this church, you cannot seek something which your mind is not set to. We see this a lot. The, the, the prime, social media is such a wonderful demonstration, like illustration for most things in life. Um, you, can, you can find every bad illustration you want on social media and not a lot of good ones. Have you ever seen a Facebook debate on a political issue between two people? They get on there and they start talking and it becomes immediately clear that neither side really is set on the truth. They're both set on defending their perspective. They're not really set on the truth. You can't claim to want the truth when your mind isn't set on the truth. In the same way, you can't seek the things of Christ if your mind isn't set on Christ. And this is really the problem that the Pharisees had, right? Their minds were set on the actions, not the God behind the actions. You could say that their minds were set on the shadows, but their minds were not set on the substance behind the shadows, or what the shadows pointed to. And so Paul warns, set your minds on things above so that you may seek him continually. Set your mind and seek. Let's go back to the children at the dinner table. They can't understand the command to sit through dinner if they fail to understand what dinner is all about. Right? The idea behind dinner is that it's a meal, it's a time of fellowship, it's a time to talk about the day, it's a time to pray together amongst all kinds of other things. It's not just merely a time to put something in your mouth because they can do that in front of the TV. Why do they have to sit through it if they don't understand the purpose of the meal? It's the same thing. How are you going to seek after Christ if you don't understand that you have to be set and understand what Christ is about? And so Paul says, set your mind on things above. Seek those things. Your heart will seek what you have your head set upon, I promise you. The seeking of things above ought to pervade our conversations. It ought to pervade our friendships, our work, our play, the golf course, any of those things. What are you filling your head with in order to do that? How are you keeping Christ at the center of your focus, in the center of your mindset? So Paul's going to give his reasoning for this. He's told us to do this, right? Seek the things, set your mind, and look with me again at three and four. For you've died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, Paul's reasoning is based upon things past and upon things future. Right? In the past, you die with Christ. In the past, you die with Christ. In the future, what? You rise with Christ. Christ is both your past and he is your future. Where else should you look? We're hidden in him. So if the Father looks at us, the Father sees his Son. And when Christ returns, we will rise to our glorified state, just as he did, 
as the firstborn and the first fruit of the resurrection. And look how Paul, he kind of words it differently in Philippians. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Paul says, our past is tied to the death of Christ. Our future is tied to the resurrection. This is why we set our minds on Christ. This is why we seek the things of Christ. He is our beginning. He is our end. There's a phrase for that we use all the time. He is the alpha and he is the omega. Pretty consistent theme. So there's Paul. There's his thesis. Seek things above because Christ is your past and he is your future. So you seek the things of Christ. And in light of this, he provides two commands. He's going to give us a negative command. He's going to give us a positive command, things to put off and things to put on. And that's our second main point. Let's look at first, things to put off. Read 5 through 11 with me. But put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked. When you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And so Paul begins by giving us this list of things to put off. This list of things to put off. And this is kind of common style for Paul. Paul does, he'll, He's going to give you theology, and then he's going to follow with a call to live the theology out. That's why Paul is so great to read through. He's practical wisdom for godly life. Here's the reason behind it. Now here's how you live it out. That's what Paul does. So he begins by giving us a list of ways to live out seeking the things of Christ. We avoid the earthly things. If you want to seek the things of Christ, you avoid the earthly things. And he gives us two categories. In 5 through 7, we have kind of this, um, this sinful sensuality. And then in 8 through 9, we have kind of this evil, evil actions we'll kind of look at. So we'll break them up like that. So first, the sinful sensuality mentioned in 5 through 7. He mentions sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. He says, which is idolatry. And keep in mind, these are things which we are to kill. These are things we are to put to death. Very strong language for how we treat these things. So let's walk through them one at a time. Sexual immorality. So this, as we translate it, the word comes from the Greek word porneion, which is where we get the word pornographic from. And it means every kind of immoral sexual uh, relation. Right? Chastity was actually a completely new concept brought into the world by the Christians. This was not a common a, a, a thing that people would have held to back then. It would have been radical. It would have been a radical call by Paul in a pagan society. And it's no different now. Sexual immorality, anything outside the biblical grounds for marriage and relationship, needs to be rejected. And it's radical in today's culture. That, saying that in a lot of countries, even Canada, can get your uh, pastoral pension yanked away from you. Culture is against it. Sexuality has been free to be whatever we want it to be. We are to kill it. We are to kill sexual immorality, put it to death. Impurity refers to moral uncleanliness. So this includes things of your imagination, your speech, your deeds of a sensual heart or of a filthy mind. Passion is a shameful emotion that leads to sexual excess. It's the same word that Paul used in Romans 1.26 for the Gentiles. Remember, he says, they didn't know God and pursued dishonorable passions of homosexuality. Passions. Evil desire refers to the wicked, self-serving lusts that we have. Covetousness, which he says is idolatry, is the craving of all of those things above which you can't have. We can actually idolize them. And friends, I can think of nothing more relevant in our culture today than this warning. We are over-sexualized and desensitized. We are feeding sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness. The idea of putting them to death has long ago dropped from the minds of our culture. 
even amongst those who claim to be part of the Christian church. For us, it means that we don't compromise. We don't compromise with these things, nor do we allow them. We put them to death. We don't put them in prison for 20 years, right? You, you, you kill them. You are done with them. That's the first category, those of sensuality. And even Paul admits in 3.7, he says, these two you once walked. Even you were part of these things when you were living in them. These were things which you lived in, but now that you are in Christ, you no longer walk with them. You no longer live in them. You no longer embrace them. It moves on to the second list of things we should put to death, the evil actions and evil speech. Look at me at verses 8 and 9. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put, on the, put off the old self with its practices. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a pastor called uh, Thaddeus Matthews in, in Memphis. I think it's in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, he, he's known, you may have heard it, he's known as the cursing pastor. Have you guys heard of this guy? Okay. So in December of uh, 2017, a video came out of the pastor insulting a churchgoer who complained that his cursing from the pulpit was a problem. And of course, the video goes viral. In 2019, he drew criticism for holding a twerking contest. If you know what that is, it's a real sexualized dance. A twerking contest at his church. Um, And here's what he says. I look at many of you who've criticized the young ladies who were dancing in my gymnasium in my church. You, and then he inserts a vile profanity right there, who are out here judging. There's nothing in the Bible about dancing, but there is about judging. Sensuality, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, Lying. Not only do they not deserve belong. Not only do they not belong behind the pulpit, they don't belong behind the doors of your church, your house, your office, your vehicle. They don't belong in your texts, your calls, or in this church. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lying. Church, we're called to put them to death. And as Paul continues in verse ten, he says, "And you have put on the new self." which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You've put off the old self. You've put on the new self, being renewed after the image of the creator. You have no time. You have no place for that foolishness in your life. Kill it. Be done with it. And then here we get one of the most wonderful uh, and, and very often quoted verses in the Bible. Look with me at verse 11. Here there is not Greek or in Jew. Circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. In other words, the new self has put to death the old divisions. The new self has put to death the old divisions. And church, this is a verse that politician, political opponents probably need to heed. Right? It's a verse that people struggling with racial issues need to heed. It's a verse that opinionated people in the body of Christ need to hear. These are words for every congregation, including this congregation, to hear. Those earthly divisions, those earthly barriers, they're dead to you. They no longer exist. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, Christ is all, and in all there is one church, one body, one people of Christ. Paul's high Christology demands application. When Paul teaches Christology, when he teaches about Christ, it demands we do something with it. And what he says is you must seek the things of Christ. Seek the things of Christ and put off the things of the earth. And so the things we put off as he begins to break them down is our sensuality, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. Right? And he says, and your evil attitude, your anger, your wrath, your malice, put those things off. Your evil speech, your slander, your obscene talk, your lying. And why do we put them off? Because we are a new self. And the new self has new relationships. So we have a thesis, seek the things above. Christ is your past and future. We have the negative command, put off earthly things. Now we're going to move to the positive command, put on heavenly things. Look with me at verses 12 through 14. 
Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So as you put these things off, now put something else on. Right? As you've taken the garments of the earthly things off, put on the garments of the heavenly things. And so first Paul says, as God's chosen people, right, a holy and beloved people, remember not two chosen peoples, one chosen people, God's people, true Israel, those who accept Christ as Savior, as God's chosen people, holy and beloved, put on these things. Now he gives us eight things to put on. He says, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, love. Let's go through those one at a time. Compassionate hearts. The literal translation of the phrase is actually bowels of mercy. You can see why I went with compassionate hearts. It's speaking of your guts. It's speaking of your inner parts. You know that, that sick feeling when you hear of something terrible that happened, it feels like it's down in your guts. The bowels of mercy. Church, we have to learn to attribute, learn the attribute, I'm sorry, of compassion amongst our brothers and sisters. A more modern expression might be tenderness of heart. We should be a people who put on tenderness of heart. That's a heavenly trait. As much as I'm guilty of it, the mindset of toughen up, buttercup, isn't. Tender hearts. So put on compassion. Second, put on kindness. It's not a naturally occurring emotion in humans. Uh, there's a, a letter to Winston Churchill that uh, Bernard Shaw wrote that had it back and forth. And Bernard said this. He said, enclose our two tickets to the opening night of my first play. Bring a friend if you have one. To which Churchill replied, dear Mr. Shaw, unfortunately, I'll be able to attend the opening night of your play due to a prior engagement. Please send me tickets for a second night if you have one. While the play is sarcastic banter, it shows a little bit of the heart of humanity, right? Like we naturally descend to harshness. Like we tend to have sarcasm. We have cutting wit. We have these things that even amongst friends, we can kind of dig a little. Church, we need to strive for more kindness if you can. Humility. So we have compassionate hearts, we have kindness, we have humility. Interestingly enough, humility is a word the Greeks never applied to themselves. The Greeks would never, never thought humility was a good thing. It wasn't seen as a virtue. It was seen as a weakness. The church of Christ could humble himself. How can we not humble ourselves? Meekness is the fourth one. Meekness doesn't mean to be a doormat. It means strength under control. Strength under control. Christ was meek. Moses was the most meek man in all the earth. No one thinks Moses was weak. Moses was not a doormat. A meek Christian is one who allows his power, his strength, and his weaknesses to all be controlled by God. Power under control. Strength under control. Patience. Long-suffering in the face of insult or injury. And this is one of the fruits of the Spirit and one that we fail to exercise daily. We live in an instant gratification society. If my burger takes longer to come out to the car than the song on the radio, I begin to get angry. And then I begin to slip back into the things that I should be what? Putting off. Do you see how these things kind of work together? How the things you should put off, the things you should put on are wonderful signs as to how well you're putting things off and how well you're putting things on. If you find yourself angered quickly, you're probably not, not putting on patience, but it also means you're not putting off the anger. It's a great gauge of your spiritual clothing is to see how, you, how these things show themselves in your life. Forbearance, bearing with one another. It's interesting how the people that you're often the closest to are the people you give the least amount of grace you notice that? People you're often the closest to, you tend to offer the least amount of grace. And we shouldn't pretend 
that that lack of charity is only something that happens among our family members or among our close friends or siblings or whatever. It happens in this body. It happens in our workplaces. We can become warm and welcoming to visitors who walk that door, yet harsh to each other. Paul says it's not right. You bear with one another in love. Forgiveness, the seventh one. And logically, uh, forbearing with one another must lead to, number seven, forgiveness. As the Lord has forgiven us. Church, we must never let the poison of hatred to fill our hearts. Forgiveness is commanded and is possible through Christ. So hear me clearly. It's not merely enough to put up with each other. It's not. It's not merely enough to put up with the body of Christ, to put up with the people in this building, to put up with our family members. It's not enough to simply refuse to retaliate. We must truly forgive. And if we struggle with this, we should be immediately and well reminded of the immense, immense forgiveness that Christ gave us. And the last one he says is love. Above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Church, if we can't put on love, then all the other garments cannot hold together. It's love that allows us to have compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forbearance, and forgiveness. It may be possible to have some of these elements without love, but you cannot have all of them. Love holds them all together. If we neglect love, we neglect harmony. If we neglect harmony, we neglect the things of Christ, and we begin embracing the things of the earth. Love is the stitching that holds the holy garments together, the clothing of heavenly things. All right, guys, we've seen Paul's thesis, right? Seek the things above, because Christ is your past and he is your future. And we do this in two ways. We put off the things of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, and lies. And then we put on things of Christ, Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forbearance, 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 sorry, forgiveness, and love. So let's move on to our conclusion found in 13 through 17. I'm sorry, 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now, I believe a more faithful way maybe to read this verse, we don't like it because it's kind of chunky, but it's a genitive, so it's a, the word is possessive. So I believe a better way to read this is to let the peace from Christ. Let the peace from Christ rule in your hearts. Church, what happens when you put off the things of this world? When you put off the things of this world and you put on the things of Christ, you receive a peace that can only come from Christ. A peace that surpasses all understanding. And what does the end of verse 15 say? He says, And be thankful. The peace that comes from Christ. And be thankful. Gratitude is the single most important way we get our focus back on heavenly things. We are thankful. Paul says you're one body. Let the peace from Christ rule. Be thankful. Let's keep going. Look back at me at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Church, we're called to know the word of Christ, to absorb his scriptures, to dwell on them, to instruct and correct with wisdom, and to be instructed and be corrected with wisdom. To worship together with the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And what does he say once again? With what? With thankfulness. With thankfulness. So the peace from Christ is to rule our hearts. And we are to be thankful. And the body is to build each other up with the scriptures, to worship together, and to be thankful. And how does he end? How does Paul kind of take this whole chunk, 1 through 16? How does he wrap it up? How does he summarize it? Look with me at 17. And whatever you do, 
in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father through him. In verse 17, Paul kind of gives us an interpretive summary. He kind of gives us a summary that interprets everything he said, whatever you do, word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Word or deed means everything in life. When you put off the flesh, do it in the name of Jesus. When you put on heavenly things, do it in the name of Jesus. When you enjoy the peace from God and the unity of the body, enjoy it in the name of Jesus. And in all things, give thanks. Let's pray.